good afternoon everyone uh usually the sessions after lunch uh, especially for audience joining from india are difficult to stay in focus uh but i'm sure you will find this session on nature based solutions exciting as we have distinguished speakers having diverse experience in facilitating nature based solutions for transitioning of land based primary economic sectors of agriculture and forests uh, when i say ecosystem <laughs> Uh, it means both the ecological systems as well as the institutions market finance technology and policy required for this transition uh, we know that almost all the biodiversity and climate change threats that we have currently in the world relate to just three economic systems and which are basically food land and ocean use on <clears throat> infrastructure and built environment and energy and extractives now what we require is systematic transitions in these systems and these transitions have the potential to generate around 400 million jobs and annual business opportunities worth 10 trillion dollars by 2030 nature based solutions in land based systems such as agriculture forest animal husbandry etc can act as critical enabler for making these transitions not only in primary primary sector of the economy but in other sectors as well we can create while creating identifying discovering or modifying nature based solutions is a function of traditional knowledge innovations and technology adopting or facilitating nbs at scale requires a uh, different uh, uh, it's a different ball game altogether and uh, it requires building an ecosystem that promotes or encourages its wide adoption our session uh, today aims to understand from the panelists perspective and experience as to how nature based solutions from primary sector can potentially contribute to international environmental goals business ambition for 1 and 1/2 degree sdgs and other national and international commitments the key is to catalyze nature positive carbon neutral and sustainable transitions of sectors industries businesses and communities we will explore how innovations and partnerships in primary sector around technology finance policy markets and institutions could possibly be harnessed and integrated to create enabling ecosystem for effective adoption of nature based solutions at scale we will start our session with dr monica lessel speaking on bio revolution uh, the direct annual impact of this bio revolution uh, in agriculture sector alone would be between uh 0.8 trillion dollars to 1.2 trillion dollars over the next 10 to 20 years which is 36% of the total uh, potential of bio revolution she will talk about bio foundations innovative work in brazil and us on bio carbon program which is an innovation for transitioning to low carbon agriculture she will also briefly speak about the bio revolution at bio focusing on technology innovation in soil nitrogen fixing microbiota Dr Lessel is uh, executive director of Bayer Foundation and head of corporate R&D and social innovation at Bayer AG. She is also a member of Bayer's global R&D executive committee and the global medical and regulatory governance committee. Her focus is on driving organizational and societal transformation by strengthening the role of science and promoting innovation and sustainability through strategic initiatives, governance processes and partnerships. She holds a PhD in biochemistry and she is a former fellow of robert bosch foundation she and her team were awarded as finalists for the master of reinvention award at london business school in 2018 and the best innovation team award by fast company in 2020 over to you dr lessel thanks a lot for the kind uh, introduction <laughs> पैर बाहर निकालिए धीरे धीरे सॉरी ओके कैन यू हियर मी नाउ एवरीवन वेल ओके या थैंक्स अ लॉट फॉर द वेरी काइंड इंट्रोडक्शन um it's a pleasure to join the panel discussion on this very important uh, topic on nature based solutions today um before going into this i uh, let me allow to start my presentation with a bit a broader scope uh, on the bio revolution and then kind of dive into uh, the uh, nature based solutions so if we look on uh, our society we can see that we face 
quite some challenges uh, overall. So it's not only climate change. Uh, so we are all aware of water scarcity, loss in arable land, heat and drought stress, which are all caused by the increasing uh, temperature. But also we are facing huge demographic challenges with an aging and also growing population, uh, expecting about uh, 10 billion people on this planet in 2050, which of course has an impact on the burden of disease, but also on the pandemic risk, which we all kind of experienced right now. But beyond these changes, we also see kind of an increase in inequality and a loss of trust in governmental organization or also even in industry. So these are all ongoing changes. And uh, what I want to highlight now is kind of what are the opportunities to address some of these challenges. And one aspect I like to mention in my talk is how the bio-revolution could address these challenges. So what is the bio-revolution? So many people are talking about the digital revolution. How is this changing our daily life? We all aware on artificial intelligence or how robotics is changing the way we work or the way we live, of course. But not many people are aware that we are living in the middle of the age of biology. So huge progress has been made in understanding molecular mechanisms and the work of microbiomes in our body or in the soils, of course, stem cells. Gene editing has been uh, a new technology which enables not only uh, gene therapy in humans, but also a modification of plants in a very precise and elegant manner. And you may have seen that the, even the Nobel Prize has been awarded last year to the identification of the gene editing technology. But what is really fascinating is the combination of the new biology and kind of the digital technology and the access to uh, handle big data volumes, which then result kind of in really new technologies, yeah, be it regenerative technology, systems biology, or also synthetic biology. So for me, that's a bit the silver lining on the horizon. And this can actually help us to address some of our challenges. And of course, also addressing um, the main SDGs. So let me give you a few examples. If you look on the current pandemic, it was the mRNA vaccines that has been developed in a very fast uh, manner and helped us to address the current pandemic. Also, if we look on um, gene therapy, uh, we have kind of the opportunity not only to treat, but even cure diseases in the near future. And the scientific progress has been enormous in the last years. Also, as we already discussed, kind of the climate change has a huge impact on food security, but with new technologies like gene editing, we can also change the plants, make them more drought resistant, salt resistant, so that we at least can also overcome the challenges in with respect to uh, the food, food supply. Also, uh, if we talk about the resources, of course, we know we have a scarcity of resources and a lot of inputs rely also on fossil fuels. Now, using the bio-revolution, we can also use other starting points and also modify chemical reactions and use it by using biological means. And finally, and I will talk about this a bit more in detail, um, we can build on the bio-revolution to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And this, I want to give you two examples and happy to discuss this further in the upcoming discussion, um, how we are doing it. One example I want to give you is uh, from a company that we formed uh, at Bayer together with Ginkgo Bioscience. 
And the fascination of Join Bio is um, the vision to actually engineer natural occurring soil microbes to allow them um, to fixate nitrogen. Um, as you may know, there are of course natural occurring microbes in the soil <clears throat> helping certain types of plants, Brassicacea legumes, to um, fix nitrogen. But for other plants like uh, corn or cereals, these microgens, uh, microbiota doesn't exist. And so it's the plan or the vision of Joint Bio to kind of engineer these kind of uh, microbes so that we have kind of a natural way of fixing nitrogen in the soil. This would of course have huge impact on one hand on greenhouse gas emissions as about 3% of the worldwide global greenhouse gas emissions come from the production and the use of industrial nitrogen fertilizers. It also would have a huge impact on uh, reduction on water pollution, and then also gives more flexibility to the growers on the use of, um, of nitrogen uh, in the course of the um, plant growth. So this is one example um, how we can build on the bio-revolution to uh, address uh, the um, challenges that we face with regarding greenhouse gas emission. And I also want to uh, give you another example. It's um, a project we have just started, which is called the Carbon Initiative. So we think it is a huge opportunity for farmers to make carbon sequestration a new income stream. And what we are doing is kind of helping the farmers on one hand to um, develop new farming technologies in order to uh, make the soil uh, able to sequester carbon. And there we use kind of digital tools like we have climate field view uh, in Climate Corp to make predictions on how to best use the land. But of course also it needs certain certification and um, measures in order to ensure and showcase how what is the amount of greenhouse gas emission of greenhouse gas emissions that has been reduced so this all is kind of contributing to our overall goal our sustainability goal of bio which is to reduce field greenhouse gas emissions by 30 percent until 2030. So this is just two examples I want to show you. One is kind of developing a new business model using carbon sequestration for the farmers and thereby generating a new revenue stream. And the other is kind of using molecular engineering to engineer microbes, enable plants to improve their nitrogen fixation. But of course we can't do this alone. So it's really, we're thinking about an ecosystem yeah? and with all the different um, options we have, be it either in venture investments, setting up new business models, or also we are the Bayer Foundation supporting um, societal engagement. So we see this as a huge ecosystem and it's about partnering and collaboration to achieve this goal. And I think that's also part of this session and I'm looking forward to discuss this further. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica, uh, for this very interesting uh, talk. Uh, I think it's a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, I would say cutting edge kind of a topic, uh, bio-revolution. And uh, when I was reading it, I was quite fascinated by the potential that it has uh, to change, uh, you know, the, the problems and work on the problems that the world is facing uh, currently. Uh, so uh, I think we will have uh, uh, more uh, questions uh, in, the, in the next session after everyone has spoken uh, for, the, for their first round. Uh, I'll introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, Mr. Nitesh Kumar. Uh, Nitesh is Chief of Party for the USAID and NTPC Limited funded 
Narmada Landscape Restoration Project. Uh, the project aims to demonstrate the interdependency of landscapes, uh, forest and agriculture, uh, uh, landscape restoration on ecosystem services, and encourage the stakeholders to engage in an incentivization mechanism. Acting as a key liaison, uh, bringing the project partners, community, uh, municipality of Indore, uh, which is a city in Madhya Pradesh, state of India, and government departments together, Nitesh is managing the show to uh, bring alive and op operationalize payment for ecosystem services in India. He enables the project operations, provides technical oversight, strategic guidance, and leadership to ensure that the project achieves its stated objectives. Nitesh has been working with Global Green Growth Institute since uh, 2018, has, has a pl played a key role in projects that have introduced climate resilience in uh, MG and REGS uh, and energy efficiency in Prime Minister Avas Yojana Grameen Houses. He has also led the efforts to mobilize adaptation fund for small tea growers in five states of India. Uh, before a Global Green Growth Institute, Nitesh has worked as a UNDP professional with Ministry of Rural Development, uh, Government of India, and his work experience spans in the domain of climate change adaptation, natural resource management, poverty elevation, land rights, and financial inclusion. Now, using lessons from uh, the project that he's working on, which is Narmada uh, uh, Landscape Restoration Project, uh, Nitesh will focus on how multiple social, economic, and environmental benefits can be accrued, uh, moving away from green infrastructure to nature-based solutions, and lessons around structuring and sustaining payment for a, an ecosystem services model in the project. Over to you, Nitesh. Thank you, Mr. Nagar, for that introduction. And uh, it is indeed an honor and pleasure to be part of this 13th Central uh, Global Summit 2021. Uh, I welcome the other speakers as well as the participants in this session on, on harnessing the potential of nature based solutions. I have a slide that I can use. I'm sharing it. Uh, is this visible to all? Yes, yes, we can see that. Thank you. Okay, so uh, before I talk about my project and how it is linked with the nature based solutions, I'd like to briefly introduce my organization, the Global Green Growth Institute, uh, to the audience, and uh, then we can talk about the project. So, GGGI at a glance, uh, GGGI or the Global Green Growth Institute is a treaty based international intergovernmental organization. It is dedicated to supporting and promoting strong and inclusive, inclusive and sustainable economic growth. So this entire uh, inclusive and sustainable economic growth is what in our parlance we call as the green growth. And it is headquartered in Seoul, South Korea, and it has 40 member countries. And uh, it is also operating in other uh, member and partner countries all to promote the concept of green growth. So any, any country can become a member of the GGGI uh, who, who is among the member states of the United Nations and uh, who are aligned with the objectives of the organization. In terms of the organizational structure, the GGGI has a assembly which constitutes the member countries. Uh, there is a council that is elected by the assembly and the, there is also a director general who is the executive body who looks at the institutes and its operations. The delivery model that the GTGI has adopted is like it's, it uh, has an embedded system where it, it works as a trusted advisor and a development partner to the government, uh, government organization in uh, its member and partner countries. Uh, Mr. Ban Ki Moon, the head the Secretary General of the United Nations, is the president of the assembly and the chair of the council. Uh, since 2018, and he's been guiding and uh, promoting the concept of green growth across the globe. We are present uh, everywhere, uh, and we are working on different domains of uh, energy, sustainable landscape, uh, uh, and in, in particularly in India, we have a very uh, wide, uh, diverse portfolio. There are six uh, projects, big projects that are, under, that, are, that are being implemented right now. The first one is on the 600 megawatt floating solar project in the Omkareshwar Dam. We, help, we have an MOU with the Ministry of 
with the government of Madhya Pradesh, where we are, uh, we are helping them in the project design, in uh, looking at uh, financial re-engineering to make the project more uh, bankable. We are also uh, implementing the GGTI bio biological compressed natural gas bio CNG program. It's a multi-country program being implemented in India, Indonesia, and Thailand. In India, we are a knowledge partner to the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas for their success scheme, which aims to promote alternative transportation fuel. We are helping the government in setting up of four or five uh, bio CNG plants uh, based on uh, organic feedstock. We're also helping the government of Andhra Pradesh uh, set up the electric vehicle charging infrastructure along the uh, National Highway 1 and on the of the cities of Vajag and Vijayawada. So we, are, we have also an MOU that is coming up with the Ministry of Andhra Pradesh. Uh, on the, we, uh, we, are, we have collaborated with the International Solar Alliance, which is again another international inter intergovernmental organization. Uh, we, are, we have set up a trust fund where we will use the trust fund to mobilize investments for establishment of 1 million solar pumping systems across 13 countries in Africa, Asia, and the Pacific. So, uh, and then there is also a renewable infrastructure, energy focused infrastructure debt fund. It's a, it's a second generation debt fund where we will be uh, funding projects, uh, funding the energy, energy based projects. And then we, uh, then there is a project called the Nomada Landscape Restoration Project, <clears throat> which is on the uh, sustainable landscape. And we'll talk about more on this project and how uh, how it is linked with this session and what are the learnings that we have from this project. So, a quick summary of the project: the aim of uh, Nomada Landscape Restoration Project is to demonstrate and establish an incentivization mechanism. Uh, so this incentivization mechanism will ensure that there is nature-based solutions are adopted to ensure continuous supply of ecosystem services, primarily water. We are focusing on the water here. What is the method? We are uh, we are trying to create a proof of concept here by improving the quantity and quality of water in the select Narmada tributary through sustainable landscape management intervention. So Narmada River is a rainfed river. It's it's a uh, it's based out in central India, and uh, it has a lot of tributaries that are feeding water into the river. So our aim is to improve the quantity and quality of water in some of these tributaries to create a proof of concept that can be showcased to the government, and uh, the government can be able to adopt and take it up. The approach is it's a participatory and collaborative approach. We are working with the communities and the government departments. To ensure that we adopt this, that the sustainable landscape interventions are adopted, practiced, and in turn and, and measured uh, for their impact. Uh, the USAID and NTPC are the joint owners of uh, funders for this project, and GGDI and IFM are jointly implementing this project. Uh, we have a project management unit that is set up in uh, Barwaha, which is in Kargon district of Madhya Pradesh. Uh, in terms of the <coughs> Rational. So why why did we look at this location and how is it suitable for a PGS mechanism? Uh, the answer to that lies that in the fact that there is a location called Jalu, which is between Om Kareshwar and Maheshwar Dam. It's very close to Maheshwar Dam actually. And Indore Municipal Corporation is picking up 94% of its supply from this location in Jalu. It becomes a very very crucial point for Indore. Oh, and both uh, the, for the for the domestic as well as the commercial users. And in the uh, with growing urbanization, the requirement for water from this uh, channel is expected to go up by another 23% uh, by 2024. So how do you ensure that there is increased supply of water? And we are also not just talking about in terms of the quantity, but also the quality of water that is coming in. So a lot of money uh, is invested in purifying uh, the water and making it useful for the uh, municipal uh, users. So, so basically, in this project, we have a project catchment area that is under enormous land use pressure. So there are there are farmers and there are forest communities who are right now practicing uh, whose activities are causing enormous land use pressure. There is degrading vegetation that is leading to increased topsoil erosion which in turn is reducing the groundwater recharge and increasing the sedimentation load in the tributary. The, uh, 
there are some areas where there is intensive irrigation happening because this is a primary a chili and a cotton belt and this is, uh, there is overage of water and this use of uh, fertilizers and pesticide extensive use is also impacting the quality of water so basically there there is a potential buyer of the ecosystem services in this case the domestic and commercial users of normal food operation there are potential suppliers who can adopt nature based solutions to enhance to ensure the supply of ecosystem services which is the farmer or the forest communities a people living around the catchment and we also have a solution where we are saying that if we are able to increase we uh, we are if we, we are able to introduce and maintain and sustain sustainable landscape management practices then the uh, water resources will improve and there could be a payment for that that can happen so basically in this project we are trying to create that we are trying to demonstrate that interdependency between sustainable landscape management practices in the upstream and the water quality and availability in the downstream users so uh, we are not uh, looking at a big area of, and uh, we have a target to influence uh, 10000 hectares of land in this project so ultimately our aim is to be able to create an incentivization mechanism and also a scheme that we can hand over, hand over to the government which will which will be which will have all the essential elements that the government can use and adopt and then scale it up and in this project immediately we are looking at impacting the water quantity by 20% and uh, uh, reducing the uh, runoff pollution by 25% so these are the immediate targets that we will be trying to achieve when we are working in a 10000 hectares of land we will also be looking at training at least 500 beneficiaries to be individuals or communities i mean uh, collectives and we are also looking at establishing market linkages uh, for the agriculture based communities so that they, they are able to uh, take up uh, you know uh, organic organic agriculture so uh, i'll not get into the details of the project activities but uh, the benefits that we see can be accrued from this activity is like one is we will be able to ensure water security and this water security is not just for the catchment community but also for the municipal population so despite being very close to the narmada river there there are areas in the catchment where what there is a huge uh, surface runoff and then the community is not able to get clean and safe drinking water uh, throughout the uh, throughout the year so so it's very important that if we are adopting this uh, we are doing the interventions this community is able to get clean drinking water and and uh, to be frank they are also connected with the, the government's naljal yojana but then the food uh, security is not the food for water security is not there and of course for indoor municipal cooperation as it grows and uh, uh, requirements for the uh, water grows it will be able to sustain itself if we are able to showcase and uh, demonstrate the impacts we are also looking at um, uh, ensuring food security for the farmers there are a lot of subsistence farmers who are just uh, doing one who are growing one crop in a year because of lack of uh, water uh, there there is a possibility that with, with the project intervention the water quality will increase quantity will increase and these farmers can also be able to use the water for irrigation purposes of course we'll also have to look at it in terms of how much water is being used for irrigation versus how much do we want it to want it to flow in the uh, tributaries and be able to uh, uh, provide for the the end users of water in indoor we'll also be creating a nature based solution infrastructures which will make the uh, community climate resilient it will decrease their, their sensitivity and exposure to uh, extreme weather events which will also increase the adaptive capacity uh, to climate change Uh, we are looking at doing forest and biodiversity conservation so uh, we have uh, in our project activities we have identified areas which can be which need which are critical which are treatable and which are uh, which requires conservation and based on this classification we have also designed activities that we will take up to ensure that we are doing this forest and biodiversity conservation so rotational grazing is one which can also uh, help in uh, improving the soil health uh, and the animal health as well Uh, we are, we are looking at also impacting the livestock so for example mahashi is a, a fish variety in, uh, that is available that is found in the narmada river and in many ways it is it uh, signifies the health of river narmada so uh, the and uh, this population the stock is going down and with our project activities we aim to improve the uh, availability of mahashi species and the communities that are dependent 
uh, upon this space for the uh, live level. Ultimately, uh, we are looking at creating a market-based sustainable solution. So uh, this entire uh, uh, system that is being created or is uh, the PS mechanism that is being developed, it will ensure that all the interventions are, in, are continued uh, beyond the project duration as well. There are market forces that will, uh, fact that will come in and ensure that uh, the uh, in nature based solutions are maintained and the co op ecosystem solutions is maintained. And to so this, we are looking at all the different uh, SDGs that will be impacting, uh, which, is, which includes the clean water and sanitation, the zero hunger, climate action, life on land for biodiversity conservation, and life below water, uh, as I mentioned about the fish. Uh, population. Uh, we, uh, this is a very wonderful opportunity uh, to introduce the PES uh, mechanism because one is that we have a very diverse landscape. So we have a forest area and we also have an agriculture area. Uh, the, we, so with a diverse landscape, we are able to create a, a model that can be replicated, if I can say. But at least we have evidence from different uh, landscape that can be uh, supplied that can be factored in when we are creating the incentivization model. There are multiple actors involved here, and we are hoping to uh, make them come together and get into a, 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 a symbiotic relationship. But it also has its challenges because each actor uh, views this uh, uh, views the model from their own uh, objectives. So, for example, for the individual farmers, they are very keen to ensure that their uh, income grows. Uh, for the uh, district. For the municipal corporation, they are they are wanting to ensure water supply. To the district level, they want to ensure that they are contributing to the different uh, commitments that they made to the center. For for India, it could be you know uh, their commitments to NDC and SDG. Uh, we are also we also have an opportunity to uh, build the institutions around this uh, model. So uh, what we are thinking about is that the payment will not go to individual beneficiaries; it will be to the collective. For example, it can be the joint. Uh, forest management committees or the farmer producer organizations, which can be incentivized uh, to maintain the ecosystem services. Indoor is obviously number one clean city in India. It has a huge advantage. The uh, government system out there is very uh, well oiled and very well equipped to uh, take up such innovative ideas. And they've also been declared as water plus, which means they're also recycling their, uh, their water, uh, grey water. And we've also been able to secure a lot of government support in, and uh, we are hoping to have a convergence with other government schemes. So uh, we have strong lining with the district management and the municipal corporation, but uh, uh, so for the infrastructure that we are developing, we are hoping to converge with government schemes like MG and RECS uh, and the watershed development program. Uh, we ultimately have uh, an opportunity here to demonstrate the first of its kind incentivization model for water in India. We know we already have one uh, that was uh, uh, that was done in Himachal Pradesh, but that was just on a, on a uh, very small uh, water body. And this is for the entire river, is something that can uh, be you know replicated uh, across uh, different rivers as well. It's too early to say that, but uh, depending upon uh, the project results and the river that we're putting in, we should be able to at least start with one river and then it can be taken to others. There are challenges here. We are talking about water, and uh, uh, for water, we are also looking at there is something called the non-revenue water, water leakages uh, from what uh, from the source to the ultimate end users. Uh, those things have also to be checked in. So, uh, standalone uh, working on what ensuring water quality and quantity will not solve the problem. We'll also have to look at it in a collective way and uh, look at other challenges. Uh, water use efficiency. So, if there is more water available, is it also possible that the farmers are able are switching on to uh, more uh, crop water intensive crops, and uh, they are not uh, very uh, efficient in the water use and scope of flood irrigation. So, we we have to build in make a checks and balances so that we ensure that there is uh, water use efficiency. We also have to be very careful uh, that there are no maladaptations. So, for example, we don't get into monocultures when we're doing forestation. Or you know we just stick to few a few uh, plantations with low diversity. This could all lead to maladaptation and uh, uh, yeah, not a very successful model. So ultimately, what we are looking at is in the nature-based solution. We have to look at engineered solution versus nature-based solution. So in our project, we have uh, we have a problem of wastewater, 
and uh, we need to treat this wastewater through uh, engineered solutions. I mean, there are NBS also available for the wastewater treatment, but it requires uh, area and also, uh, you know, so so that that uh, so that uh, factor has to be uh, taken into consideration whether when we are look when we are looking at NBS, how cost effective it is, what is the time horizon that we are looking at, and what uh, what are we are we willing to wait for some more time to look at the impacts or do we want immediate solution? So all these questions have to be answered when we are opting out, opting for uh, gray or green infrastructure. Ultimately, the payment for ecosystem services can make NBS more sustainable and scalable. Why we say this is like the PS scheme can generate new sources of funding for conservation, restoration, and valuation of natural resources. And PS schemes can enhance efficiency and allocation of natural resources and economic resources. However, having said that, there is a lot of academic rigor required and a lot of scientific evidence that needs to be produced, along with field demonstration to build the confidence among the government, community, and market forces to invest and promote NBS. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nitish, for this uh, wonderful presentation. And I think uh, it's it's quite uh, relevant also. India, if you look across all the cities, almost all the cities, uh, you will find tankers providing supply of water and uh, water is going to be, it's already there. It's a, it's a number one problem in urban areas and many rural areas are also suffering from a water scarcity, uh, especially that area of Indore that you are talking about uh, in Dhar, Madhya Pradesh. I think that's facing a uh, brunt of that. Uh, uh, so uh, we'll. I, I think this is very uh, a great transition to what Rajiv is going to talk about uh, and actually, India probably is world leader in demonstrating uh, success of nature-based solution and our successful implementation of watershed program uh, over 60 million hectares for the past few decades uh, has resulted in conservation of soil and water, uh, leading to obvious uh, storage and possibly an increase in soil organic carbon also. Uh, though the issue of water scarcity still remains, uh, Rajiv Ahel, who is our next speaker, uh, works with GIZ India as Director of Natural Resource Management and Agroecology, where he leads bilateral project on water security and climate adaptation in rural India, uh, and another project on sustainable soil management. He supports a number of other projects in agroecology, rural development, social protection, sustainable farming systems, market-led development approaches, including uh, public-private partnerships, uh, artificial intelligence, value chain development, and FPO, uh, and a lot more. Uh, Rajiv has uh, over 33 of, uh, years of experience in working with international agencies, governments, and private sector in India and African countries on these issues. Uh, Rajiv will basically talk about adopting nature-based solutions at scale uh, and agroecology orientation to connect nature, farm, and play. Uh, over to you, Rajiv. Uh, thank you, Shalish. Am I audible? <clears throat> yes, yes. I, I'm on. Right? Thank you. Uh, good day to everybody, and thank you for listening in and probably also contributing ideas and questions later on. Uh, uh, just a quick one, uh, I think, uh, just to share about German international cooperation. Uh, this agency is the implementing agency on behalf of German bilateral development support uh, from the Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development globally working in about 110 countries. The journey in India has been about more than 60 years old. And right now, the work that we've been doing is, that I'd like to share with you is around how to look at natural resource management and ecosystem restoration, resulting from off-farm to on-farm gains for farmers and livelihoods and making them resilient. Now, of course, the problems in India, uh, we, we know that if you look at actually that water is to adaptation, what energy is to mitigation. This is well understood. Most of the challenges and problems around climate uh, fall on people through direct and indirect impacts through water. Uh, and this is also the place where it can be remediated as well. So we decided to work with water as a focus and see what could be done, water with a climate angle. Now, of course, things in India are quite dire. Uh, there is a, going to be a gap of about 570 billion cubic meters in terms of de demand supply of water in agriculture sector by 2030, just another eight years, nine years away. Uh, five, of in, five of the world's uh, most water crisis driven 20 cities are in India. Delhi is number two. 
uh, almost 60% of the groundwater of India has declined in the last 10 years. Almost 30% of, therefore, consequently, because of this and many factors, almost 30% of Indian land is impacted by desertification, land degradation, and therefore this does not support good livelihoods and good ecosystems. And uh, as was also pointed out earlier by Nitesh, almost 70% of the surface water is contaminated. So what do you do? When you, when you need to do ecosystem restoration at this scale, what do we do? So what we found interesting was that if we could look, so a lot of work on watersheds, but you can do one watershed very well, but the watershed above and below may not do its job well and may actually undo the gains put in by people in terms of ecosystem services and restoration. So we started looking at sub-basin level water uh, hydrologies, but we also decided not just look at surface water, but also look at uh, soil moisture. We started looking at the unconfined aquifer, that is the water just below soil where normally your wells are, and then the confined uh, groundwater as well. That's where the bore wells end up. So if we could look at all these four waters, look at the water demand and supply today and in the future, therefore come up with a water budget, and then also put a climate lens to it, some sort of a scenarios of what could change in 30 years, 20 years, how do you orient your water planning and therefore your whole resilience or your ecosystem restoration around that? Now, this is very complex, not just because it involves too many uh, you know, types of work, but also because it involves a lot of science, a lot of evidence, a lot of facts. So to make it easy and doable, we, uh, working with Ministry of Rural Development, developed a process of using GIS spatial imagery taken from public domain, free of cost, and looking at various layers and helping planners at a village and panchayat level in India be able to look, look at the problems, come up with a water budget, look at what needs to be done. And it's interesting that if you, if you really start looking in the 10 districts where we piloted this sort of a planning done locally using science, but also local knowledge and ground truthing, has ended up identifying more than 650,000 activities and interventions. And most of these are restorative activities. So you're looking at check dams, you're looking at vegetation cover, you're looking at uh, you know, uh, reducing the uh, amount of water used by irrigation. So and looking at restoring uh, uh, wetlands, restoring uh, farm ponds, so, and looking at soil moisture. So if, if you really want to do this scale of activities, and if you really want to work at 600,000 villages that India has, you want to look at 270,000 local bodies that India has, varying all the way from Himalayas to islands to deserts, then there has to be a way not just to plan beautifully, but also to look at where the funds could come from. And this sort of an investment cannot come alone from private sector. These are not private lands. These are huge investments to be done. Therefore, looking at government, Therefore, you need an ecosystem for ecosystem restoration at that scale. And to do that, we started working closely with the Ministry of Rural Development and Ministry of Water Resources to look at what are the available programs which are adaptation oriented, friendly. They may not be designed for climate impacts, but they can have co-benefits. They can be tweaked to provide funds. I'll give you one example. There's a program called Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Generation Act, which is basically an act in India providing food security, promising up to 100 days of work to any family in rural India, which says it does not have enough work. And this has to be provided to them within five kilometers of where they live. There's something like 260 activities allowed under that. So if you look at almost more than 100 of those activities that are around nature-based, uh, uh, private land, common land sort of interventions. So this planning approach that we help create allows people to plan in a way where this money, which is about eight to $10 billion a year, which is what government invests, actually starts impacting, not in some base work into nothing, but actually into restoring your nature-based responses, your ecosystem in a way where going forward in future, people's dependence, people's vulnerability to climate, people's resilience, uh, resilience in livelihoods around vegetation, water, agriculture could enhance. So you basically set the primary context right at scale so that the private sectors and others can come in and work on it. Now, uh, what in the end happens is that there is a district level plan. So the 
GIS based plans from a village panchayat level across a watershed stitch up easily and they stitch to a block level, they stitch to a district level and they just stitch up to a state and national level. Now, why is this important? Because almost all of the public finances can be converged and therefore redirected around a plan at a district and lower level. At state level, this helps can help define strategies and priorities, enter into state action plans on climate change, not just with what is needs to be done, but actually also with resources of where these resources could come from. And as we speak, this sort of a planning process is being rolled out by the government uh, with technical support from us in about 170,000 of the local councils. By next March or April, all of the 270,000 local councils of India would have done some level of planning. So this is the first part of how these plans are available at a district level. However, these plans also have areas which are only responding to conservation, management, restoration. But if we really want to grow beyond, we want to look into developing, developing livelihoods. And I think this is where the private sector comes in. So these plans become a plug and play space for private sector agencies to come in and see, okay, now that we understand what is the water budget here, can I come in with my CSR with the small amount I have and not make a big dam or a big or a big structure which I cannot maintain, but actually put it into more of capacity buildings and trainings? Can I use my agri-tech knowledge to look at how now the, the demand orientation and the demand requirement, the water losses, the climate advisories, the other sort of inputs, because the other investments that need to go along for these private sector initiatives to work don't need to be put by private sector. The restorative processes are coming from public financing. So it could be very surgical. It could be more clinical. There is an analysis available. One can work on it, improve it. And really, the corporate sector and private sector can come in sharply. Imagine almost all of India investing 8 to $10 billion, 60% of this on natural resource management restoration. This has been happening for the last 10 years. Maybe with this planning, we can improve its focus. And this could be the way to build further to take the nature-based solutions into resilient livelihoods. So I think this is one area where uh, our experience shows that it is possible for even people and uh, semi-technical people at local council level to use this very rudimentary GIS-based planning, some level of statistical data locally available from secondary sources, do a ground truthing, and then come up with responses that could be the basis for turning this whole story around. Of course, it cannot happen just with public finances. That's the backbone, but the ribs would have to be the private sector coming in, coming in with its innovation, coming in with wonderful products as we heard about carbon fiber farming. So can this now come into such areas where some level of water development is energizing some level of agricultural development? And instead of doing it in the middle of nowhere, pick up such areas and then it'll be easier to take the process forward. So this is one part of the story I wanted to share. The other part is the work that we've been doing, many of us, over the years when we approach natural resource management and environmental uh, you know, restoration. So we work on watersheds separately, then we do something there. But just by the time this water uh, you know, access availability is happening, the project is mostly over. Nobody really ends up developing agriculture on top of it. It is a watershed project, finito, gone. There are people who are working on sustainable agriculture. We look on on-farm sustainability. But how much water efficiency I try to do on-farm if there is no groundwater? If the groundwater has gone 400 feet deep, what do I do? What level of energy do I use? Till how long do I keep using it? So the work that we do on on farm cannot be dissociated from the ecosystem services that Nitesh talked about. They have to be linked. They have to be contributing to each other. But are we doing this together? Many private sector companies only focus on on farm and are not interested to look at off farm. Now, if there's a huge public program going on all around you, why cannot we link our on farm perspective to the off farm activities that the public financing is doing? So this planning processes could bring it together. However, even if we do very good sustainable farming interventions, in the end, if the safe and healthy food that we want to produce does not meet the expectations of the consumer, does not reach the consumer, they're not interested to eat it, they're not interested to pay for it, again, it will be a grant-driven process, some small niche investment, 
but after a certain level, the pull required to get that whole sector going will not be there at scale to really sustain a whole process of what I call nature, farm and plate to work together as one frame, pushing and pulling from all sides, both from an ecosystem layer, from a financing layer, from an you know, incomes layer across the value chain running everywhere. So, so this this construct which is which which connects the dot is what we're calling agroecology nowadays. It's, it's not a new concept. It's been there for some time, but this is what we're trying to use that come to anything with a complete agroecological approach where ecosystem meets food system transformation, and take the whole end-to-end -end process in design and implementation. Now, within the Indo-German Development Corporation in India, this is the uh, uh, this is the strong orientation we are taking for all of our projects to be developed in the future and in the rural areas and around natural resources. Obviously, the outcomes around climate, resilience, biodiversity happen automatically as well. I'm very happy that this is also being echoed in a large manner by a lot of the government policies and programs. So you hear of uh, BPKP, Bharatiya Prakriti Krishya Vikas. So this is indigenous and natural agricultural programs that are being supported. Andhra Pradesh is a huge program on natural farming work with 700,000 farmers. So there are these responses coming up where it allows our ecosystem restoration work to support sustainable agriculture, to support healthy foods uh, and the safe consumption of it and string it all up in something that will go forward. The other interesting work is also what uh, one of the big national banks of India, uh, Na National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development, NABAD, is just starting. They've been working on watershed for the last 15 years. They've done more than 4,000 watersheds, but they are also saying that they now want to work on an agroecological construct and this framework. So we are working together. How can the, the watershed areas that they've already developed be connected to sustainable farming, be, be connected to markets, farmer producer organization, instead of doing farmer producer organization somewhere else, if there is a level of agriculture and ecosystem development, why not do it here? So this whole strategic way of approaching it is what is coming out. So this program that Nabad calls Jiva is also starting. So my purpose of sharing all this with you was to say that there are so many places where we can partner and there are so many points for us to connect, hook up and work together. So thank you, Shailesh, and back to you with that. Thank you, Rajiv, for this uh, very interesting talk. Uh, uh, what the points that you have raised are very, very valid, uh, especially related to, you know, one is the partnership because the scale of the issue and the solutions provided by nature uh, are so vast that it requires a greater degree of collaboration. And now to uh, basically harness that collaboration or create that kind of a collaboration, that itself is in a task, is a, is a big task. Uh, also, getting together private sector, uh, you know, public finance, uh, private sector finance, and, uh, you know, the innovations and the work that uh, ground level organizations and donor organizations are doing is something that is required for scaling this up. Uh, before I uh, basically open it up for the audience questions, so there are a couple of questions that, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to ask and uh, uh, ask all of you speakers. Uh, see, the primary sector uh, engages women mostly, and uh, we know that there is a large feminization of agriculture in India for a long time now, and with increasing migration, and the trend is somewhat uh, reversed due to COVID impact. But again, the uh, men folk are going back to cities for their wage labor occupations, uh, and women are there in the villages to tend to uh, agriculture. And we know that women are also primarily responsible for livestock economy in rural areas. Now, in this transition that we are basically talking about to nature-based solutions, uh, what role women can play? And this is basically based on your experience. And I know that Dr. Lessel has been a champion of uh, women in science. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of work uh, by Bayer Foundation is being done in Africa around that. Uh, and Rajiv, uh, GIZ is also working uh, on gender aspects. So what do you think uh, will be the role of women and how can we involve more in this particular transition? Yeah, maybe I can uh, give it uh, a, sure. short, a brief start. Uh, uh, as you rightly said, it's a, a kind of uh, very important and close to my heart. 
And I think women are key kind of, it's a change process, yeah? And I think women are key for this change process, yeah? As we know, I mean, many smallholder farmers are women. They are responsible also um, then for uh, education, education of the kids and so on and of themselves. So if we can, and we also work with the foundation with social entrepreneurs, and if we can help women to get better educated, especially in climate smart practices, uh, this of course will be uh, also essential for the change that we need to see. Uh, and then also uh, to address the challenges we discussed, be it water, uh, greenhouse gas uh, reduction and so on and so forth. So yeah, I think they are instrumental and the better we can also uh, target and cater to their needs, um, it, it will help us all to drive this change process. Yeah, uh, Rajiv, and before that, there was a point, I think in the uh, earlier session today, there was a very uh, great insight which someone spoke about and they said that, uh, I think it, this was a, a lady from SEVA, uh, Self-Employed Women's Association, and she was talking about how uh, basically uh, giving a kind of, uh, you know, remuneration for the care work for women, or basically uh, designing that kind of the ecosystem where women can have more uh, time at their disposal so that they can work uh, uh, in productive sector and that can raise their income by double or triple. So this is just a small intervention and we need to think differently uh, around that if we want to create a, a ecosystem for nature-based solutions. So over to you, Rajiv. Uh, no, that's a great question and I would just probably add two elements to it. Uh, one is this, uh, maybe to go back to this Mahatma Gandhi Narega, which is an essential social safety net called down about uh, called down by almost about uh, 120 million families in a year uh, for various reasons all the way from disaster to mass market crashes to droughts to all sorts of things that are happening around them interestingly almost 55 to 58 percent of the workers if not more on a national average are women in some states they even go up to 70 percent and what it is doing is that it's allowing women, uh, not just seasonal agriculture work at low rates, but it's actually giving them 100 days of work, uh, very close to their house in very safe conditions, and unskilled work, which allows, which, which makes it possible for them not to have to migrate. So what's, what we are seeing continuously is that given such sort of uh, ecosystem collapses, and the, they start becoming ecological refugees, the entire families start moving. So this is not aspirational migration. This, this is crisis migration. But if the family gets stable around 100 days of work, then the woman in the, stays in the village and the child goes to school mostly. And then the husband may find work nearby or may go to a nearby town or may even migrate. But this whole dislocation, the social dislocation of women and the consequent qualitative impact on family life is, 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 taken, is reduced considerably. So I think that's an interesting way to work. The second one, of course, is the huge and significant self-help group, group movement in India. You're looking at something like 2.3 million self-help groups uh, of women, all self-mobilized, uh, uh, all sorts of sections of society, uh, saving some money and then using that to uh, leverage money in terms of credit from the bank. So, so the, the difference is that you can have individual entrepreneurs but if you look at social, these as SHGs as entrepreneur groups, as farming entrepreneurs, as marketing entrepreneurs, as any types of activities, uh, we are finding that they're far more productive, far more uh, honest. Uh, well, I'm, uh, you know, just giving a gender yeah, statement here, but the work shows now on the ground that they are far more responsible about many things and being a social collateral group, it helps. So I would say that the collectivization of women in such groups should be looked at also and used uh, by the private sector in various responses as well. And this could strengthen it. Thank you. Back to you, Shalish. Uh, Nitesh, you have uh, some comment on this? Yeah, just to add on what you mentioned, uh, the collective, collective uh, strengthening of the collective. So even, uh, for example, there are water user groups that have been created, mandatorily created, and there are joint source management communities. Committees. They have a certain mandate of uh, human participation. They could be there on paper, but they're not active. So, for example, in, our, in my project, I'm very keen to ensure that the women participation is actually visible. They are uh, key decision makers, and they're able to uh, look at the 
entire you know model they are because they are inactive there in the model so so for example if because if the sag group can also be promoted to take up value addition services from the ltf collection that is happening that they also empowers them empowers the women to be to play a more proactive role in the conservation in the uh, ecosystem restoration and on the supply of ecosystem services yeah yeah thanks nitesh uh, i think the second question that i have is about because uh, the we we know that nature based solutions exist and in fact the un has come out with this 200 uh, list of 200 nature based solutions and uh, uh, so while we know that nature based solutions are there it's basically about you know creating an ecosystem to encourage its adoption and seeing that the maladaptation does not happen like nitesh we were talking about uh so can you a uh, little bit more talk about the incentivizing mechanism uh, how are you thinking of incentivizing and this is also one of the questions from uh, one of the audience yeah so the incentive mechanism is still in the early stages we are looking at uh, demonstrating the project measuring the impact and based on the project results we able to create that incentivizing mechanism so we started our implementation from 2020 we have done the baseline survey we have identified the areas the intervention and we are we are getting into the incentivization mechanism so we have done the priority of the ecosystem services what are the ecosystem services for which there is a buyer and what are the ecosystem services for which the community is very uh, is, is, the, is at the top priority for the community having identified that we are coming out with indicators that will be able to measure and based on the uh, measurable impact indicators we will be able to create them so so ultimately the incentives will be transferred uh, from the government to community that's what we are starting with this is the assumption that we are starting with that in the municipal corporation will be collecting the money from the end users and it will be transferring that money to the catchment communities not individually but in groups and it could also there could also be different ways of incentivizing for example if the farmer has to pay some taxes Uh, for its for for their farmland, those taxes can be uh, waived off for the for the farmers if for those farmers who are participating in this model. So the so various models are there. We are still in the early stages, but uh, we hope to come up with a solid model that can be replicated and scaled up by 2024. Thank you. Thanks, Nitesh. Uh... Uh, Rajiv, you talked about the role of uh, private sector, and uh, you were basically primarily, uh, you know, talking about because the investments required for, uh, you know, ecosystem level changes uh, or transitioning is quite huge, and uh, uh, the role private sector can play is primarily related to innovations, doing some things which public finance, which is especially available in India through different schemes. uh can which can be leveraged for uh you know nbs level work but if we look at the scale of uh, funding required i have uh, one of the questions from uh, nikhil in the audience uh, he asks that uh, there is a gap uh, there is a requirement of around uh, 4.1 trillion financing gap for nature and especially uh, and how can we bridge this uh, mainly through private sector finance in nature positive value chain financing uh and what will be the role of science based targets or corporate climate commitments in enabling such transitions because we know that now uh, i think this uh, is also happening because of the covid uh, pandemic that we are real- realizing and especially business com- community is realizing that you know businesses also need to be resilient to the disruptions which are uh, there currently and we are living in a risk risky world so how do we uh, close this gap and what role markets will have to play and what role the private sector financing has to play to bridge this gap and we know that in india we have these schemes but if we take a global uh, you know perspective how do we do this and uh, this is also for uh, dr lesel if you can also pitch in with your global insight on to this issue Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So I'll try to answer it. Also, I think also in Indian context, when it comes to really developing uh, next level value chains, processing, market linkages, the financing is not easy. And here, the public financing is also not very, very well, doesn't work very well. In India, we have a thing called private sector lending, which is supposed to provide a cheap uh, credit or even support to farmers, but it's very limited and difficult to access. I, th- I think uh, as soon as one looks at this next level, uh, so I would still feel 
they have the large so there are two ways one is the larger more uh, you know uh, core uh, ecosystem restoration which requires heavy investment could in one is the core is coming from public sector uh, the other ones which especially have value chains around them where some level of uh, uh, you know you know uh, uh, making it fungible becomes possible without altering the true nature of conservation for example what's happening with the biodiversity act in india where there are these bio, bio, biodiversity uh, charges to be paid to the village level biodiversity committees uh, for use of bio resources so some of these could be worked on as partnership models so there in this case the private sector may have to go down one step below the aggregators and suppliers and actually work closely with the village groups which is not so easy but could be done by involving good non government organization the advantage being here then because of the direct link the business can get a bit de risks then there is not a market in between which is playing uh, you know games you can actually talk directly to self help groups to farmer producer organizations working on these things secondly so and on, on the other side i think there's a huge amount of uh, financing need to take about 10000 or so farmer producer organization government has intended is in the process of making which will not work unless they really have good market linkages and uh, supply chains connecting to private sector so again i think this is an area where halfway uh, you know the market and the private sector comes and connects and takes it forward so so these these definitely are areas uh, where work could be done thanks uh, dr lesel yeah um no thanks yeah i think that the private sector of course plays a pivotal role here and uh, i think on different levels one are of course the own commitment on sustainability in reducing uh, emissions and contributing uh, to the sdgs and there are also a lot of companies uh, making kind of their commitment to become a net zero which then also requires uh, we will set off a lot of funding also for respective projects uh, and also nature based solutions because otherwise these goals cannot be achieved Uh, and then on the other hand of course it's enabling businesses like uh, as i mentioned the carbon farming uh, where of course you can generate a new income stream for the uh, for the farmers and then it not only may enable a new income stream but also maybe access to um, to finance uh, or also kind of now being able to uh, be part of uh, food chains and so on and so forth so i think it's both uh, of course uh, there will be um, money available for for projects coming from private a sector because of the um net zero goals and then of course reducing the own emissions uh, accordingly and and then also enabling respective business models so i think there are multiple ways a uh, private sector plays a role here and and can have a huge impact i think that's interesting because it's not only the finance domain but also you know different innovations in or innovations in different spheres which actually private sector can uh, you know start and and basically uh, encourage these kind of innovations in whether it is marketing whether it is institutions and all that where public financing initially is not available once you get attraction uh, on these solutions then maybe you can look for public financing but i think private sector may have a role in uh, you know providing these kind of innovation finance uh, if you can call it uh, Shalish, can I just add one aspect? Sure, sure, Rajiv. You know, one very interesting experience, which uh, so usually the practice had been that all sorts of uh, livelihood work in India only needs grants, or there is only hundred percent credit from the bank, which farmers cannot take or the groups cannot take. So there's very interesting work that uh, the KFW, our development bank, GIZ, and NABARD did about eight nine years back, where almost about eighty million euros worth of uh, retail financing. was given out to very vulnerable groups in some of the most vulnerable pockets of india if you put it on the krita map they are in almost all the orange and red zones and these were first time groups formed but what we did and we learned was actually how it was working is if you take about 8 to 10% and give that as a back end grant to the organization promoting them to help build up capacities uh, for the farmers to understand how to develop businesses to be trained for it and then the rest is 90 to 92% loan can you imagine and in these are areas where you know for others as well in india many of these areas uh, get interest waved off politically and communities are you know somehow oriented that they don't need to return bank loans 
94% so far of all loans have come back. Yeah, yeah. So I think this mixed blending of credit is if financial institutions start using more rigorously, I think it will be a huge amount of financing opportunities out there. Yeah, back to you. Yeah. Thanks, Rajiv. I, I think that's the experience that we also have uh, because uh, uh, Avishkar Group has a microfinance arm as well and uh, similar experiences we also have on this. Uh, there's one question from uh, Dilshad uh, and uh, he's basically asking that isn't end user financing a gap in adaptation of some of these practices, uh, nature based practices on the uh, ground? And what are the some possible solutions that can be we can build here? in order to accelerate these adapt uh, adoptions. Uh, so basically the end user financing, uh, which is uh, you know a farmer, uh, and that's what the issue is here. Uh, do you want to take it? Or Nitesh? Okay, uh, so... Uh, Sorry. Go ahead, Nitesh. Yeah, let me try. Let me try to uh, get some uh, learnings from other projects that can probably answer this. So yes, you are right. Uh, the end user financing is a gap, and uh, to be able to circumvent that or to get over with that with that gap will require innovative financial instruments. So when we are when we are looking at uh, setting up a trust fund with GGGI and ISA. So between GGGI and ISA, we are setting up a trust fund that will uh, provide technical assistance to create an enabling ecosystem. Now that ecosystem in itself will only be created once we are able to look at all the diverse actors. So basically farmers who are uh, subsistence farmers who do not have the capacity to invest in capital. And we know that uh, the farmers do get loans, but then nobody is going to provide them uh, loans for capital investment, which will have a long gestation period. The payback period is long. So there needs to be concessional finance or some financial mechanism that can sustain them. For example, there's, there are different uh, ways, you know, uh, first loss guarantee that we talk about, or if there could be a model in which group of farmers can be, uh, can, 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 can be motivated to take up a, an, an, an adaptation measures that, that, that has a shared, you know, uh, shared risk and also will be able to be more uh, financially viable. So yes, uh, there are some uh, solutions as well. We are, we are experimenting on some of them. And uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's all that I have to call to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nitesh. Uh, uh, there's uh, one question, uh, Rajiv. I'm not sure uh, you know, if that is pertinent, but uh, basically if you can, uh, if you have some experience on restoring urban ecosystem, because mostly we have talked about rural ecosystem, but at least the perception has been that we are talking about rural ecosystems. But talking about urban ecosystem and Nitesh's exam example actually is, uh, you know, bringing in indoor municipality and how we can create a kind of system uh, where uh, payment for, of, for ecosystem services are uh, uh, basically benefiting the rural areas or at least the watershed uh, from which the water for uh, municipality comes from. Uh, but Rajiv, do you also have experience in urban uh, restoring urban ecosystems or Nitesh, if you can uh, detail it out further? Uh, over to you, Rajiv, uh, and then Nitesh. So, so we have uh, an entire vertical working on uh, urban renewal and climate smart urban development. Uh, there's been work that is happening, but I, I'm, I'm not the best person to speak about it. So uh, maybe I'll let Nitesh tell more about it. Yeah, but I realize the question is more about the restoring of the urban ecosystem. So my uh, our project uh, does not really cater to that, but yes, we will whatever ecosystem services that we uh, aim to generate and uh, supply. That is something that will be benefiting the indoor municipal corporation. So and they are they also need to if you look at their urban ecosystem, they need to ensure that there is a loss of like the non revenue water is minimized. They are able to increase the water use efficiency, uh, and the uh, end users are you know. Uh, and you just can value the they, they are also they are also contributing uh, to the catchment communities cost development of maintaining of the ecosystem service yes yeah. maybe, maybe uh, shall, one angle to urban uh, story in india is that uh, almost 
a very large number of urban settlements are not cities they are these uh, hotchpotch towns uh, which are not planned and i think i can say from my experience in mathura district where we found that uh, these uh, you know half village half town hybrids uh, almost 80 to 90% of the ground of their surface water is 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 totally grey water spoiled Uh, so what we started doing in these areas of course is to start working with things like root water harvesting uh, drainage management soak pits uh, so very low level tech but also very effective uh, but otherwise uh, the surface water contamination issues and uh, the ecosystem destruction of habitat is is very all the wetlands have become yeah septic tanks literally open septic tanks so how do you stop these drains going into them so there are these activities that can be done at source uh, in the villages and households but uh, most panchayats don't know how to do it and they don't have a specialized funds for it so how can we do it at scale so there are very good examples in tamil nadu as well where they've done work with the vertical filters uh, and horizontal filters with sand beds and Uh, the entire hamlet waste goes into the nearest rivulet but cleaned up very decentralized so there is a lot of work which could be looked at back uh, yeah. to you yeah thanks uh, in fact there are some models uh, which uh, you know sort of some of the corporate foundations especially uh, hcl technologies and they have a partnership with the uh, noida uh, authority noida is a, a basically a town uh it's a city in fact uh, just on the outskirts of delhi and they have a tie up with the uh, authority there and they are basically greening and that's kind of a model between uh, you know private public private partnership uh, you know that, that's coming up and i think in urban areas also and we know that in india uh, especially there are uh, some cities and i was reading that let, at least chennai and others are pretty low in per capita uh, tree availability or i think per a uh, square kilometer tree availability in the city and that causes a lot of uh, problems not only for the ecosystem but also from the uh, for for the citizens of the city and especially in case uh, you know we will see more and more migration into these larger metro cities and uh, uh, we usually do not think of uh, you know migrants benefiting from the green cover in the city but uh, in case of delhi itself uh, a lot of people depend on because uh, these trees were planted earlier on in the city uh, many people collect uh, you know fruits from these trees and sell in the market so some of their livelihoods do depend on that they also collect firewood at least some of them uh, you know uh, get the firewood from these trees so in any case i think urban landscape or ur- urban restoration also is a very important uh, as the cities are becoming larger and larger and uh, you know different issues around ecosystem and uh, people's uh, livelihood depend on that so we are coming to uh, you know uh, final stages and uh, i would request uh, you know you have uh, now uh, listen to all the speakers and uh, you know just two three minutes uh, summarizing uh, your points uh, for this session uh, uh, starting with dr lesel Yeah, thank you very much. Um yeah, I think it's uh, was very interesting session highlighting of course again also the importance of of water and then also the ecosystem approach and I think this is something we all have to take into account. Uh, it's about collaborating yeah between private sector, public sector uh, and um <clears throat> then of course also NGOs, foundations uh, to make that change happen, yeah. And but we also need to keep in mind of course that we have to find also entrepreneurial solutions. Uh, to make it sustainable yeah of course public funding can kick off uh, some uh, experiments approaches but then on the long run we need kind of uh, entrepreneurial approaches to make it sustainable and i think this is something we all have to keep in mind and that's also why we also from our side support a lot on in terms of um, yeah entrepreneurs and how can we get them to market access so that on the long run they become self sustainable yeah uh, so let's also think in this direction how can we generate new business models uh, out of this uh, overall situation so that's my two short summary thank you very much yeah thank you uh, nitish yeah yeah so uh, pgs like the payment for ecosystem services which will uh, promote uh, nature based solutions is a very important uh, method 
and uh, that that but that needs a lot of rigor you know the, the amount of evidence that we have the amount of data that is available is not sufficient to build the confidence of the stakeholders so when we are looking at involving a, a government entity they need to be assured that this this is being quantified this is being measured and based on these measurements only the payments can happen and there are a lot of uh, different factors that come into play which are a lot of external externalities that are beyond your control having said that it is important that we progress in this direction there are there is a consensus so there could be policy level interventions government would be government could come out with policies that say that the purification of water can happen less, not just to grey infrastructure but there also be, could be green infrastructures that could take care of the quality parameters of for water there could also be uh, you know concessional finance for farmers who are willing to adopt organic products because they need a gestation period uh, they need some time to uh, and that the horizon has to increase so every time when we are looking at uh, looking at the solution we we cannot have a fixed fix solution at least when we are talking about nature based solution we need to increase the time span we need to have a we need to have patient capital going into it and then uh, we also have a lot of different players who are coming into into the uh, entire ecosystem and they, they, that that requires a lot of trial and error there could be failures we could not we uh, could not uh, guarantee success especially when you know there are so many uh, different uh, different variables that are that are, that are in action so yes uh, we are in in our in our case we are focusing on the water and water is a very important resource we, we want to ensure water security for uh, everybody not just for the uh river catchment communities also for the urban population which is growing and which needs more and more water as as it grows but there has to be a analysis of the cost and the benefits so so when we are building a green infrastructure what are the benefits that are going to be explored what is the cost and similarly when we are building a green infrastructure or a green infrastructure or they could be there via hybrid models that can be adopted so in all uh, there is no uh, quick fix solution we need to be patient we need to collect data we need to uh, have that rigor and then be able to uh, build confidence in uh, nba thank you thanks nitesh uh, uh, rajiv uh, yeah, absolutely i i agree totally uh, with monica's statement as well that uh, while the basal load work can happen for public financing how do we really bring private sector in especially for the entrepreneurial innovations and finding that spirit to go beyond the limits of what we have so uh, i i also think that uh, even as we work on nature based solutions the ecosystem uh, uh, stability sustainability there would however be time from time to time the shocks both for the markets uh, the the production system the private corporate production systems around agriculture as well as the farmers and i i'm really missing uh uh still uh from a very agroecologically safe perspective insurance products either which look at end to end value chain uh, and therefore help uh, you know de-risk it or for multiple crop based uh, resilient agriculture system i mean can you believe it i was talking to an ngo very strong one today morning working in Tem in kerala and uh, they have come up with this very resilient very productive uh, around the year cropping model with 23 crops and they went to the bank and they said that we need an insurance product to cover it and the bank said no you know what you take out all the other 22 crops keep one crop and we'll give you an insurance product this is not nature based uh, approaches at all mm -hmm. so i think how do we get financing and insurance institutions to start looking from a non industrial perspective to the really the how nature is and how nature based solutions are uh, yeah so i think this would be areas to work on for the for future but i would still say that i would really like that if the corporate sector players from different uh, backgrounds uh, go to the district uh, collector of their district ask because they are very scared of going very close to the government people right but to go and ask that do you have this uh, uh, gis based plan for the district ready can i get a copy can i take a look and then see where they can come in and add value and you know bring profit to both sides through that yeah back to you uh, thanks rajiv and uh, thank you everyone for this wonderful session we covered a lot of ground we talked about you know cutting edge technology uh, 
uh, gene mapping and uh, solutions which the science provides to uh, you know talking about payment of e for ecosystem services approach which basically incentivizes uh, nature based solutions to be adopt adopted at scale and we uh, uh, talk about how to create an ecosystem uh, where nature based solutions are adopted by different actors the role of collaboration and partnership is at the heart of this and we all need to come together to design solutions to implement these solutions and structuring markets for nature based solutions is also very important and lastly what rajiv said uh, you know if someone if the projects if the individuals and entrepreneurs are uh, you know creating those nature based solutions at scale and all that the ecosystem how that is behaving uh, the example which rajiv gave about not getting credit for a biodiverse farm is something so we can talk about we can have nature based solutions but unless the markets and uh, credit system uh, does not support it these will not be able to ad be adopted at scale so i think these are some of the challenges that we see in transitioning from uh, the current system to a res more resilient nature based kind of solutions in primary sector so thank you all for joining this session and a very fruitful session for us i think we got the learnings and we will take forward the uh, these learnings and uh, execute some of these and i hope that uh, you also had chance to network uh, among the audience and uh, thank you all